welcome to another session of Midweek Matters. Last week we started looking into the study of Psalms and David. Samuel had approached David, and, and if you look in 1 Samuel uh, 16, 13, we see where David was anointed by Samuel. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. So we understand that David was a chosen man of God. Um, this week we're looking at chapter 51 of Psalms, and the lesson's title is God Delights in a Contrite Heart. And I, to be honest with you, I had to look up what the word contrite meant. Um, and Webster says, contrite, feeling or expressing remorse or penitence affected by guilt. A broken and contrite heart filled with a sense of guilt. So, you know, it's easy for us to say, I'm sorry. Uh, this past week, I had the opportunity, my granddaughters were down at the house, and they got into it. They had a little tiff, and they were screaming at each other, and I sent my wife around to see what was going on. And the funny part about it is, you get this, I'm sorry. But... Did they really mean it? Because 15 minutes later, they were at it again. So a lot of times people say that they're sorry for doing something, but are they really sorry? Um, in the past, I've had the opportunity to go sit in court and watch people. And it's funny how people get up before the judge and say, I'm sorry for doing this or I'm sorry for doing that. But in reality, there's been times I've gone to court and the judge says, well, so good to see you again. Were they really sorry? Key verse says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And that's found in 1 John 1, 9. And the lesson focuses, states, a contrite heart abandons and sin and seeks a close relationship with God. A truly con contrite heart is one that realizes it needs God's mercy. To receive that mercy, a person confesses known sin and seeks heart purity. When contrition occurs, an individual changes, both inwardly and outwardly. Now, to set the tone, chapter 51 is a psalm of David. So chapter 22 was a psalm of David. This is the first time normally when you read a book, you go chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. Well, this is a situation where chapter 51 actually happened prior to chapter 22. Now, what is going on is if you look over in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting with verse 1 and going through chapter 12, verse 25, what's happening in this to set the stage for today's lesson is David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. He had ordered the, basically the murder of Uriah, her husband. And the funny part about it is we see in chapter 12, it says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, and he gives a story about two men, a rich man and a poor man. One man had everything, another had nothing. And the rich man basically took hold and took things that belonged to the poor man. Now, the funny thing about it is David's response is, Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord get, lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. So David is pronouncing what should take place. And he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Then the story turns. It says, Nathan then said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. So that sets the stage of chapter 51. So what is the difference between someone who is so sorry for doing something wrong and a person who is con contrite? When is it appropriate simply to say, I'm sorry? And when is it appropriate to show contrition? In today's lesson, David went beyond being sorry to showing evidence of a con contrite heart. 
Section 1 says, a contrite heart seeks God's mercy. And that's found in Psalms 51, verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O, o God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Seldom have we encountered a prayer so full of anguish and yet so full of hope as Psalms 51. David, a shepherd, a psalmist, a warrior, and a king of Israel, indeed a man of God's own heart, had sinned in a despicable way. In addition to committing adultery with the wife of one of his soldiers, he sent that soldier to his death, thus adding murder to his adultery. The prophet Nathan confronted David with his sin, and the king confessed. This psalm is the recorded prayer he offered to God. Not citing his own merit, but appealing to the character of God, David cried out for mercy. He based his request on the unfailing love and great compassion of God. No English word adequately translates the Hebrew for unfailing love, but it implies a loving, close relationship. David's sin had adversely affected that relationship. A perceptive writer acknowledged sin's destructive influence on one's relationship with God. So as we see in David's life, David had that close relationship. We see it going back when he was anointed king. And then we see how God protected David from Saul. So we see here... Even though he was a man of God, he was also human and made mistakes. The difference is he asked God for forgiveness. He was a broken man at this point. It says, when David appealed to God's great compassion, he was like a helpless child calling upon a compassionate parent. David's deep desire for God to blot out his transgressions. David did not want God simply to draw a line through it, but to erase it completely. He also called upon God to wash away the iniquity and cleanse him from the sin. David understood the stain of sin permeated his being and required strong scouring to remove the con contamination. He wanted God to cleanse him until he shone like brightly polished metal. No single word could describe David's offenses. So he used three, transgressions, involved turning away from God in a spirit of rebellion, iniquity, speaks of crookedness as opposed to up, uprightness, and the third word, sin, is to miss the mark and fail to measure up to God's standard. And we see in Romans 3.23, it tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How does God see sin compared to the way we see it? It says God ob obviously sees sin as exceedingly wicked compared to the way we typically view it. A lot of times we look at sin and we kind of slough it off as a mistake. David here, he saw what it was really like. Seeking God's mercy leads us to confess our sins, and that's the key right there, is to be able to confess our sins. In section 2, it says, A contrite heart confesses known sin. Psalms 51, 3 through 6. And David writes, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict, and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. It says, from, far from denying his sin, David confessed it. To no one's transgressions is not a dead knowledge of sin committed, but a living, sensitive consciousness of it. David could not escape awareness of his sin. It was always before him. The good news is that he acknowledged it. So as Donald Williams points out that this is the first step to healing and recovery. He further observes, when we take our sin to people, often we get only condemnation. 
when we take our sin to God, there is absolute justice and absolute mercy. When David confessed to God that he sinned against you, you only, he was not minimizing his offenses against Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. Rather, he was correctly observing that while our sins may adversely affect others, ultimately we must give an account to God. So keep that in mind that we can have a hidden sin, we can do things that are against God's teaching. Ultimately, we have to give the accounting for our actions. David recognized his sin was deeply ingrained and dated from its birth. Even from the time his mother conceived him, sin in conceiving him. David was not saying his mother and father were guilty of sexual sin in conceiving him. He was admitting that the nature of sin was present in him. From the moment of conception, he was confessing, I am not simply guilty of one sin or many sins. I am a sinner by nature. Not only David, but each person, even before committing acts of sin, are afflicted with the nature of sin. David was ahead of his time, anticipating the promise God later made through the prophet. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. This is found in Jeremiah 31, 33. This is something only God can do. And if we look back at Jeremiah, the verse says, But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Why are we reluctant to admit we are guilty of sin? And the writer goes on, he goes, Pride often gets in the way of a humble confession. We tend to defend ourselves and hide, hide our eyes from the truth. I want to read that one more time. Pride often gets in the way of a humble confession. We tend to defend ourselves and hide our eyes from the truth. Sooner or later, we realize our need for purity as well as forgiveness. Section 3 goes on and says, A contrite heart desires purity. That's found in verses 7 through 12 of Psalms 51. David writes, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain. We're seeing David right here, and he's asking to be cleansed 100%. He's remembering back to when Saul was out to get David. He remembers how Saul was made king, and then he turned his heart against God. And he remembers the Spirit of God leaving Saul. It says, David repeated two remedies for sin. He mentioned in verse 2, he called for God to cleanse him with hyssop which was a bushy plant used in various cleansing rituals. It was also used in the cleansing, in the connection with the Passover. If you go back and you look in Exodus, you can see where the children of Israel took the hyssop bush and they spread the blood of the lamb over the door. Um, it goes on, it says, to be clean is to be pure and without blemish. David was ashamed of his sin and called on God to hide his face. He previously admitted that what he did was evil in God's sight. Now David longed for God to blot out all his iniquity. Once cleansed, he would stop hearing God's judgment and begin hearing joy and gladness. His bones were not truly crushed, but the expression symbolizes the deep anguish in his soul brought on by separation from God. Determined to deal with sin at its death, David, death, David called to, on God to create in him a pure heart. The old heart forgiven but unchanged would produce temporary results. David wanted a permanent solution for his sin. David wanted God to renew a steadfast spirit within him. 
Instead of being fickle, David longed to be consistent in his obedience. Perhaps David remembering, remembered King Saul's tragic separation from God. After Saul disobeyed the Lord, God rejected him as Israel's king. David did not want to be cast from God's presence, nor did he want God to take his spirit from him. When he was anointed king, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully among David. That was what we read in 1 Samuel when Samuel was anointing David king. It says, Thus David longed for God to restore the joy of his salvation. To his steadfast spirit, David added a willing spirit, an attitude of submission to God and his law. How The author asked the question, is how does a steadfast spirit manifest itself? And he goes on and writes, the steadfast spirit manifests itself through perseverance in the midst of difficulties. We talked about the difficult year that we have experienced in 2020 and 2021 with everything that's going on. I want to read that again. A steadfast spirit manifests itself through perseverance in the midst of difficulties. Section 4 says, a contrite heart leads to inward and outward change. It doesn't stay the same. And that's found in Psalms 51, 13 through 17. David writes, then I will teach transgression your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. One of the marks of a repentant heart is the change, both inward and outward that indicates a person has turned from his or her past. David determined he would teach transgressors the ways of God, resulting in sinners turning back to the Lord. David's testimony of God's grace and our testimonies as well will convince others to turn from their sins. Sin closes our mouths so that we no longer glorify God, but forgiveness will open our lips to declare his praise. The sacrifice of animals and many burnt offerings on Old Testament altars were never adequate to forgive sins. They simply pointed to the true Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we look, if you look in John chapter 1, verse 29, we see the words written here. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. David writes that in the Old Testament, and it's a foretelling of Christ's coming. He said, what God delights in is a broken and contrite heart, or a crushed heart, the condition of one who realizes the awful sinfulness of sin. It's not just simply to say, I'm sorry, but it's truly to mean in your heart that you're going to change your ways through God's help. He leaves us uh, thinking about a couple of questions. It asks here, he says, how have you changed since Jesus came into your heart? And two, what behaviors or attitudes do you need to submit to God's cleansing? You know, one of the things that the author says, the answer may include a change of habits, change of language, change of desires and purposes. Appraisal, and then it goes on and says, but honest self-appraisal may result in fresh confessing of a need. And it leaves us with this, what God did for David, he can do for you. Till next time, next week, when we're looking again in Psalm, keep in mind, David, he was had a contrite heart. He openly confessed his sin, and it starts with true confession. Until then, be safe, have a great week. Look forward to seeing you next week.